everybody welcome to zykel's uh, webinar on strategies for closing procurement's critical skill gap today I have with us uh, patrick conoll from uh, the hackett group uh, patrick leads the development of hackett's intellectual property in areas of strategic strategic sourcing and procurement he has more than 15 years of experience in research and advisory roles and, you know will be our analyst today and share will share insights with us his recent skills and outlooks study uh, we all have with us a small panel discussion following uh, insights shared by patrick uh, kagosh uh, from zykus will be moderating the session uh, kanish has uh, leads the uh, procurement manage, pro management team for zykus and been working in the industry for more than a decade uh, he has been instrumental in successful Uh, procurement application adoption for a large number of uh, global thousand organizations and jim will be uh, sara jain from uh, western dental sara again has more than 15 years of experience in strategic sourcing e procurement procurement transformation and process redesign including systems implementation with large mncs in uh, north america and europe so i'll hand it over to patrick and let him start okay thanks um so i'm patrick and i'm the research director at the hackett group hackett's a advisory and benchmarking firm and uh, we do a lot of annual studies and written reports on different topics and late last year we we did a study uh specifically around talent management um with procurement and understanding what some of the trends were and what some of the skills are that are really going to be needed not only today but in the future. And so uh, today I share with you some of the highlights of that study. We published the results of it a little bit earlier this year. Um and have a little bit of a discussion towards the end. So hopefully it'll be interactive and you can certainly ask any questions you have in the chat. Now, one of the things that when we look at overall talent management and procurement One of the bigger trends that we are tracking is this idea that procurement the role of procurement and how it's defined is changing. And what I mean by that is traditionally procurement was looked at more as a transactional organization, maybe facilitating certain processes, facilitating the order, facilitating the buy, but not necessarily a lead role. A role where you're um really becoming a, a thought leader or an advisor to the business. So we see that changing though. We the business and key stakeholders are really expecting more from procurement. They're looking for that trusted advisor. And, and as those expectations change, the skills and what's required of for procurement executives also changes. And so we'll see that as I go through some of the data from our study that you know is no longer being looked at as as a back office function. You know, there's a lot of these strategic thinking and problem solving going on and it requires an entirely different set of skills. So we'll talk about that. So what we're looking at here, we'll just jump right into it. Um here are some of the big categories within sourcing and procurement. We asked folks, what are your critical and and major objectives going into 2015? And the top 3 things, things like strategic sourcing, category management, SRM, I tell you we've been doing this study for a number of years and those are always in the top 3, sometimes in different order. but for the most part strategic sourcing category management and SRM are really kind of the key things that you know people are focused on every year year in and year out as we get below that though this is where we see the most change and the most shift in the priorities you see data analysis and reporting being the number 4 critical item in terms of where procurement is focused this year and that's really no surprise i mean we see what's happening out there there's all this data everywhere and we're trying to figure out ways we can capture it report on it get smarter use it for negotiations and so it's no surprise that's priority that comes talent management and i can tell you that talent management somewhere in the middle of the pack here in terms of priorities is actually a increase in focus in talent than previous years talent has always been kind of important to procurement and sourcing but certainly not at the top of the agenda and we see it rising up in this broader spectrum of priorities we're somewhere in the middle of the pack we expect to continue to increase in terms of priority and what about why the takeaway is one of the biggest reasons why is that there's a real skills gap out there we just need to become more of a trusted advisor to the business what we're seeing is is a lot of folks aren't 
aren't, you know, trained or they don't have the backgrounds to really effectively do that. And something needs to happen, something needs to change. Now, when we ask companies, so, okay, you're focused on um, talent management this year, and, and you're, you've got some transformation initiatives planned. Where are these transformation initiatives really going to be focused? Let me pause just for one second. I see in the questions that um, someone posted that the slides aren't showing. Can I get a confirmation from someone that you can see slides, and it might just be this one person, or is it everyone? I'll get a confirmation. Okay, thanks, folks. <laughs> um, <laughs> so everyone can see them. Um, maybe someone from the Zykus team can help that uh, person sort it out. Okay. So we ask about transformational activities. You know, where are you really going to be focused in training and development this year? Um, or in talent management overall, I'm sorry. And number one area, training and development. More than developing job profiles, focusing on competencies, more than career pathing and progression even external hiring and recruiting. And so the fact that training and development programs out of all the transformational areas was one of the biggest focus where there's the biggest plans for change tells us that a lot of companies are looking internally to see how they can help rise the, rise the profile of procurement. And within procurement and sourcing and maybe even within other business functions, if we draw people into procurement or raise the profile of the people that we already have, these changing requirements. And so it's kind of an interesting dynamic because it switches between folks going out and trying to find people in the field or recruit from big consulting firms or whatever it is. But we're seeing people are really doubling down on training. And I tell you that even from our own perspective here at Hackett, we're getting more and more demand for training sessions, understanding certain areas, spending a day on a specific category, whatever it is. So training is really, really key. But technology also plays a role here. And if we look at this slide, the green represents kind of core talent initiatives, and blue represents um, technology initiatives within talent management. And you can see the blue bars here. There's quite a few of them where talent plays, a, or excuse me, technology plays a key role. So, for example, developing an information reporting strategy or establishing data governance, data, data stewardship. Companies are really seeing that talent and technology are intertwined broader strategy and, and understanding how you better support what the stakeholders need. So we thought that was interesting too. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, now, now this slide um, is that the most SaaS companies, where are your biggest concerns within skills and talent? Most focused? What's maybe less of a concern? And so the very left-hand side of the spectrum, those are the most serious concerns of the kernel. As you go outside on the circle, you see things getting less and less serious in terms of how much focus, how concerned procurement forcing is about an issue. And we want to display it like this because there's a couple of things we want to talk about. One of the first things that we notice, because we've done this study for a number of years, is if we look at this outside um, spectrum, we see a couple of things like the act of growing use of outsourcing on development plans. Making adequate skill levels as older workers retire. Dealing with talent in different regions. Impact of increasing globalization offshoring of procurement resources. Okay. So four major initiatives in outsourcing global skill levels as older workers retire. They frankly have been in the news and the media quite a bit. But what we're seeing, what we saw from the past times we've done this study, these initiatives are actually much closer to more serious concerns. Have now started to get, you know, have become less of a concern. Outages. People figured out in a lot of cases how to deal with outsourcing, how to find the right mix of service placement. Companies have a global model for procurement, and they've gotten through some of those hurdles. And they're also less focused on this idea of folks retiring and losing those skills. They started to shift their focus to how do we more productively incorporate millennials into the workforce. And so Zykus had a couple of talking points around this later in the presentation, and we'll get to that. But the takeaway here is that some of these historic concerns are starting to move to the fringe, and things like productively integrating the new generation of the workforce is becoming more of a focus. Technology is becoming more of a focus. As we get to the real kernel here of what's happening, 
The biggest concerns are developing leadership within procurement and the ability to attract and retain talent. So developing this leadership capability, and you know, what does leadership mean within procurement? It means reactiveness. It means agility, being able to quickly adjust to stakeholder requirements. It means being able to trust an advisor and quickly give folks the decision and information that they need at their fingertips, not a week or two weeks later in some report format. And so dynamic change is the skills that are required that are changes. But I wanted to n note on that because it really is different than what we've seen in the past in the focus, and we do see a change. Here for a sec, because I do see some comments, and I want to make sure. Okay. Uh, okay. We'll keep going. So, just another view on the data. What we tried to do is create some graphics, because if any of you have attended a Hackett webcast before, we tend to be very, very heavy on the data. So we tried to to make some different types of graphics here, and I'll explain them as I go. Um, what we have here are some of those major initiatives that I talked about before. On the y-axis, we have the ability to address. So how comfortable companies are with their ability to really address a concern head on. And the overall importance on the x-axis. Again, you see strategic sourcing, category management, SRM, up in the right-hand quadrant of very high importance, but quite frankly, area where procurement sourcing feel like they're able to address these areas pretty well. SRM kind of on the fringe. But then management really falls into this area where still high importance, but not big ability to address it. And so this is a good way to look at the data where otherwise you may not see this. Sure, it's number four or six in importance. The ability to address is just as key. And we feel like talent is one of those areas that still needs a lot of work. Procurement did they come up with? It still needs some work. Data analysis and reporting. Again, top of mind for a lot of um, CPOs especially, but the ability to address is still somewhere in the middle. And then supply market intelligence capabilities. This is an area where some companies are trying to leverage multiple sources, build internal capabilities, but it's still a real struggle. So, where gaps? So, in study, what we asked was we asked companies what most important skills for human executives to have today, not just executives, managers across the board. How important are they, and how effectively are they being applied today? And to read this slide is in the center. This is where we have the strongest gap, or the, the strongest results. And what I mean by that is importance and effectiveness are about the same. This isn't much higher and effectiveness lower, or vice versa. Here is the area is their procurement from a skills perspective feels like they're best aligned and doing well. So have things like project and program management. Transactional stuff, procedures, admin knowledge, financial analysis, controls experience, expertise, and then some legal and commercial expertise. No surprise, I feel like, that these are the areas that procurement is strongest in, where, you know, they've really been focused on in the past. Frankly, when you look at job descriptions out there, these are some of the areas that really highlighted. The challenge is that a lot of these areas don't necessarily match this changing profile of the procurement executive. So as we move outside of this circle, we get to less and less alignment. It is where it's very important still, but there's, they're not as effective. So go to the poor results, the areas where we have the biggest gap, we see things like SRM, relationship management, interpersonal skills and relationship management, strategic thinking, analysis, and risk management expertise. So these are the four areas where procurement sourcing folks feel like there's the biggest gap between where they are today from a skills perspective and where they need to be. Ship management interpersonal skills is something that we're seeing is increasingly important. I was talking to a CPO not that long ago that said that, you know, for the most part, they've moved almost all of their transactional activities and their support activities either into a center of excellence or another group, and every one of the folks with a CPO's organization are client-facing, they're facing out there talking to folks, understanding requirements, being a trusted advisor, and that requires this level of relationship and interpersonal skills that might not have existed before, and strategic thinking and analysis. And apply risk management expertise is something that we increasingly see as being important. And this is just for heavily regulated industries. This is not the board. Understanding probability of events what the impact is going to be on the business and advising 
them, understanding risk around specific suppliers, skill set that is really getting baked into a lot of procurement organizations that really wasn't a focus before. Some procurement organizations are really viewing themselves as a risk management and mitigation group, specifically with suppliers and understanding and working with them and making sure they protect the business and the brand. And so take a much broader role when it comes to risk management activities. Some of the things that we saw in the middle, things like change management, Six Sigma, data analysis, collaboration, vacuum and technology systems, you know, these are all important things. They fall somewhere in the middle. But to focus on a couple of things on this slide, I'd really focus on historically, things we don't need to focus on hiring for as much. And then going forward, things that we really want to look to close the gaps on, especially supply risk and relationship management type skills. Now, one of the questions we get quite often is, okay, so how do we get there? You know, what, especially when we come to come training and development. You know, what's really working out there? And we have this effectiveness scale on this axis. What's really working? And, you know, what's really being utilized the most? And what interesting takeaways from this? Things like web-enabled learning and development programs, formal classroom training, and some level of entry education is reported as not being as effective as people would like. And a lot of us can relate to this. You know, I think everyone has been in these sessions where we've had to sit through maybe a week's worth of training or three days' worth of training on something. And by the end of it, your head is spinning. You don't remember anything, and it all goes in a binder on a shelf. And so this pile of training where it's, you know, dream a fire hose, right, is, is becoming less and less effective and less and less leverage. To a lesser extent, you have these CBT, computer-based training type curriculums or maybe you join a procurement organization and you get a list of 15 different CBTs that you need to take that come up to speed. Well, by the third or fourth one, you're you know, kind of clicking through it and thinking, oh, I can't wait to finish this, right? And so we're finding that while a lot of these tools are out there and people have invested a lot in these tools, that they may not be the most effective way at some of these problems. Now, works is certainly what's more intensive in terms of effort and investment. Things like leadership development programs. Coaches and mentoring, on-the-job training, sitting side-by-side side with your peers and seeing what they're doing on a daily basis. And it's just assignments. So it's assignments in a way of really getting people, you know, assigning them projects, what they can do with them, to push the limits of what their, you know, what their comfort zone is, to get thinking in a different way, and going out there and working with stakeholders and, and having a, a kind of a fresh look at things. And so the idea being only the key takeaway here that getting out in the field, if you're manufacturing sites, visiting those sites, if you stakeholders in certain regions, going to see them, staff rotations, very important. Getting out there, seeing the business, working with the business, a hands-on approach is the most practical training and learning experience. Now, I know this is against a lot of what we see and what we're hearing out there, but that's really what we feel is most effective. Now, one of the technology, and I know Zykus has invited um, me here to guest, and, and, and I thank them for that. When it comes to technology, tools like Zykus and others have out there, what we're hearing from a training perspective is what people really want is more of a real-time experience. And so rather than having a long training session, make the screens usable in the first place. Make it intuitive. Make it look like what we're looking for every day in our Amazon-like experience. And when we can't figure something out, give it to us in a click of a button, a help text. Here, help for a certain form or a field. And if that doesn't work, another channel and maybe a chat with a help desk or an IT help desk. And if that doesn't work, then we get a phone call. But this multi-channel, this omni-channel customer experience where it makes everything easier and more intuitive is really key. And you don't train for that. If things are built in the right way, then we'll get there. But that, you know, it's really a key takeaway. It's interesting to see this data, and we've seen this data over and over again in terms of what works and what doesn't. Now, a couple of other data points we wanted to share. One of the concerning things that we saw in the study was that a lot of procurement organizations, and procurement, we are grouping procurement and sourcing in most cases, have very little in terms of career paths defined, spanning from entry level to middle management to first level management. The top performers, very of them have put in place a career path program for their, for, for their teams. 
And, and I think that's a really important thing for us to focus on as procurement and sourcing executives is how do we put career paths in place so we can better retain people that we know are going to be able to add a lot to our organization? How do we make sure that procurement has a career path? And here, one of the interesting things is that in a lot of cases, really retain great staff, at least for a couple of years or, you know, to get through a transformation, the career path is actually outside of procurement. So procurement, in a lot of CPOs that we talk to, is being positioned to, you know, maybe new graduate students or high performers in other parts of the organization as part of the company where you can get experience, touch points with a part of the organization or the corporation. There's very few, you know, roles within the company where you can get that experience and exposure and touch points to all of the organization. And so positioning it like that, these procurement executives in, getting them experience, but also not being afraid to use procurement as a stepping stone to most other parts of the organization, and then potentially back over a number of years. And so the idea of, of really mixing resources across different businesses is really becoming more foundational and fundamental to what we see. And we have data to support that. So what you see on the left-hand side is then to procurement manager and professional staff that have backgrounds outside of the procurement discipline. And it's the idea of pulling people in out of procurement, even for business, to be able to add more, whether it's category expertise, whether it's business acumen, whatever it is. That's a very big number of folks who actually aren't lifelong procurement executives. The point here is just really around continuous improvement. And one of the I wanted to highlight here, and we, we do try to weave some data in here because I know folks like to see this. One of the things that we saw with continuous improvement was that it's absolutely a big differentiator for what we consider world class. And SACIT, so we will carve out a certain section of our study respondents based on different criteria to, to determine who's world class. And here, one of the key characteristics was this idea of continuous improvement methodologies. So in procurement, having Six Sigma black belts having running projects, embedding this within the procurement organization. These kids improve methodologies that maybe have been in manufacturing, or they've been in IT, or they've been in R&D, infusing them in procurement too, and these folks can really help move these projects along. I wanted to highlight that because there's a significant gap between what we consider world-class adoption and the rest of the world. A couple minutes left here of talking, and then we'll kind of open it up and um, so I can cover a few things. Of the most widely needed skills in procurement. So we ask companies across the board for the widest variety of procurement roles, what do you consider most critical? Broke these into general skills, which is this lighter blue bar, and procurement specific skills, which is the darker bar. So relationship management and interpersonal skills, the number one area, the number one in terms of criticality today. But strategic sourcing process expertise, Commodity expertise, SRM expertise, they're still important. But problem solving and strategic analysis are also at the top of the list. And so it's as important as you look at this and you see well, how do we really need to shape, you know, who we're hiring and where we're hiring. And today it's more about relationship management, problem solving, and strategic thinking, and about things like maybe the specific category expertise or, you know, a specific know-how around an organization or commodity expertise. So it's a changing profile that we talked about before. Where are we going? And this is just as important. What we asked is, okay, that's the demand, but what are the skills that are going to have the biggest increase in demand over the next two or three years? And this is increase here. So the big increase. So the increase is 45 cents for management and process improvement. And being able to manage through some of these larger transformations Next on the list, SRM expertise, being able to work with suppliers, understand performance, understand how to, you know, facilitate a QBR meeting, understand how to really work and drive innovation from your supply base. Again, another big area of increase. Thinking and analysis, and then supply risk management expertise. So this is a small subset of a very large set of skills that we asked about, but we want to highlight the ones where we see the biggest change. Now, um, as a follow-up, I know uh, Zykus is going to provide these slides, and I believe they're actually providing the written report that 
um, summarizes a lot of what I'm talking about today. We have very detailed skill uh, profiles that we've developed. So for a specific skill, how we've defined it at different levels, at a very granular level, something you could almost build a job, a job requirement off of. And so if you're interested in something like that, feel free to reach out to us and we'll see what we can provide. Now, let me see how we're doing here. Okay, so I think what we're going to do here is pass it over to Dykus, and they're going to talk a little bit about this millennial workforce and some enablers that they see. So take it away there. Thanks. So, um, Patrick, you did mention about the millennial workforce coming into the procurement domain today, right? So we see from Zykus today that the procurement folks today, they're looking for, you know, more and more innovative ways that they, you know, make their work more efficient. And technology is becoming the enabler for that. Now, what we see also is an increase in the adoption or the demand for mobile applications, for advanced analytics, or you know, enterprise applications which is covering the entire procurement uh, suite, right? From, you know, this entire source to base suite. And you know, even though the slide says millennial, I mean, uh, honestly, see that from all, all procurement users today, which companies we work with, I mean, it's not just related to the millennial generation per se. Uh, the other thing that we notice is, you know, the folks are used to working with applications like you know, uh, perhaps like Facebook and you know shopping sites like ebay's and uh, amazon's of the world and they expect the same kind of interface and the usage when they're working with the procurement applications now this has become the paradigm for our design approach too so we believe that the fundamental of a good procurement application day is usability simplicity and ensuring that you know people are easily able to use the application and that's becoming our fundamental um, is for uh, creating applications. So having said that, uh, you know, probably I'll kind of uh, pull that in and, uh, you know, open this up. So some of the questions that we actually had, right? Um, so do you see a gap today in terms of technology adoption in procurement as uh, compared to other industries, other business functions? Uh, Sarah? Uh, thank you. My uh, personal experience is is, is no. Uh, I think that uh, the technology that we're using is moving, definitely moving in the right direction, um, and uh, is trying to accommodate the the need to have um, a sort of faster um, user interface as well as the online chat and and the uh, the accessible help desk. I mean, and those are things which, which definitely are. are um, are visible within some of the the IT tools that we're using within procurement, um, but you know, as as we continue to uh, integrate the millennials in in the workforce, it is definitely something I think that we need to take consideration whenever we um, select any any new tools. As far as um, the company that I work in is concerned, I don't really see any any major major gaps. Uh, back into that. You know, I, I agree. I think one of the most fascinating things that we're seeing is the sales and marketing, for the most part, has always really led the charge, I've found, in, in terms of new technology adoption. You know, there's a lot more budget, quite in most cases, to, to allocate to these things. But what we're seeing is, is procurement is applying some of these you know, concepts of CRM and the sales and marketing world to SRM. Um, you know, the way that we understand suppliers and build a profile around them and interact and keep all the information in one place. So I think procurement really leading the charge on applying some of these principles of sales and marketing technology to, to the, the way they do work. Um, and so I think that's really fascinating. We've got a ways to go, but I think, you know, we see um, a lot more openness these days to procurement executives Look for new tools and really pushing the boundaries of what's possible, being happier, satisfied with you know kind of the old way of doing things, and, and being open to even emerging technology in some cases where it makes sense, um, especially where it might make sense to com to provide some type of competitive edge or differentiator to the business, um, like um, risk management and commodity hedging and, and volatility um, and understanding that and some of the modeling that's going on with that. These are certainly things where procurement's bringing new technology to the table, even. So, I think uh, we're starting to break through when it comes to technology. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, moving on, so, you know, we talked about the right technology right, right now, which is 
developed by the procurement world. From there, from the right technology, we wanted to move to right scaling. Now, what we see today when we speak to our customers, right, that you know, they want to realize the return on investment from an application quickly, and that puts a lot of pressure on the users to deliver quickly. You know, what we noticed is it doesn't matter how great your application is, unless the users are really able to leverage his applications, use them to his fullest, you never be able to realize the true potential of that application. Uh, and very, uh, you know, succinctly put, we see the Pareto rule being applied here. Now, when we look, when we talk to, uh, you know, users of procurement applications, what we hear is often it's just about 20% of the application that's actually being used. Now, that brings to a fundamental question of, you know, what is going wrong there? Right, and what we realize is probably there's a huge gap between what we expect the users to be, the level at which the users expect it to be in terms of adopting technology and adopting the application, and where they actually are. And that gap can be addressed by right setting up with the right help. As Patrick mentioned earlier, right, you know some of those classroom uh, processes, you know, having you know online manuals or you know having books that you can refer to doesn't often work, right? You need to have on-demand content. The application needs to understand what's going wrong and provide you with that help right when you require that. And as I guess we realize that. So we have kind of designing applications to ensure that help is always there with you as and when you want it. Uh, there are metrics on the screen that you can see in terms of what we're doing. Other than that, obviously, the application itself has to be intuitive. I mean, I don't want people to actually go and visit these um, collaterals or health content that we have, we want the application to be as intuitive so that, you know, you can just start working. And that's what Patrick also spoke about. So, you know, at this point in time, uh, you know, again, uh, I want to bring, you know, Sarah and Patrick in. Um, what role do you see uh, training play in terms of adoption of an enterprise procurement application? As far as, far as my team is concerned, I think, uh, our day-to-day -day, uh, use of, of, of training really supports some of the, the costs and, uh, that you've mentioned, both you and Patrick. Um, I, we don't tend to uh, end the, you know, the day or long training, um, prior because it, you know it's a, it's they're more expensive and uh, it's a big chunk of time away from the business, which I think uh, these days is hard to, to carve out. And then so um, I think we've had better success in learning, uh, learning on the job coupled with um, available um, access to help us and when we need it. So, you know, we we really do um, get a lot of value, uh, out, like I mentioned earlier, out of the, you know, the live chats or being able to talk to somebody about a specific um, point where that we need help with or just referring to a, an online brochure. I mean, I think as you know, as far as I'm concerned, I think the um better able to, to retain that um because there's just way too much content in a uh, on a week long course. Um so really look for those in the the IT applications that we use, just having a variety um so that, you know, different people's learning styles are accommodated and also um, we don't sort of take up uh, too much time either. And Patrick, you want to add anything to that? Um, I think that I found to be most effective, had an opportunity to go on some of these site visits, um, is for you know, for the group that's really using the tool to go to another um, one of the software vendors' customers and spend a day with them, you know, looking over their shoulders, seeing how they use the tool. And it's always, there's always, a, you know, at least a dozen kind of aha moments in, in those types of meetings where, you know, people will use these tools differently even than the software vendors ever intended. And a lot of times it makes more sense or it's more intuitive than, than what, you know, what is the way it was originally designed. And unless you can get out and see how people are using it, see how they're being effective, um, I think that's really the best way to, to get out there. And any time I've ever participated in those things, it's really amazing um, what people gain from that. Um, the other thing I'd say is when we think about procurement, and so especially when it comes to infrequent buying, so put out a solution where people are making purchases that um, are may somehow guided within some parameters that you've set, 
I'm a strong believer that training should not be required for that activity. We should go into these things assuming that we're going to be able to train the infrequent buyer or the supplier that logs into a portal and has to do one or two very basic things. I think everybody has to push and push and push on, on software vendors. And, and I, I know, Zyke, as you're, on the, you're on hosting the call, but I think you, you understand this. And, you know, it's to push to this point where we don't need extensive training, where there's usability, where it is this Amazon-like experience and it looks familiar um, because, the, you know, it's changed, right? What, what people are expecting, especially what this next generation of workforce is expecting, is not the same type of application. And so I think we have to adjust. So I think um, that's really, really my key takeaway there. No, I understand that, Patrick. I mean, you know, I roll out a great new feature. And, you know, obviously I, I'm not able to connect with all my users. They start playing around with it. They don't really understand what, you know, how to get value out of it, and they just don't use it. You know, that effort that I put in completely goes on the drain. So I completely understand. You know, you get that feature, you should be able to use it without anybody having to connect your own. I completely understand that. Uh, but having said that, Patrick, uh, again, uh, one thing that I feel that, you know, when a uh, company takes a decision to go for a particular, you know, vendor, Sometimes this aspect is actually not really considered to that it should be. Uh, do you think in the decision-making uh, process this aspect is really given its uh, due credit? No, I think I think it's missed a lot of times. You're right, and even we've you know we've said that some of the classroom training isn't effective. I think um, you know when putting a new tool in place, you really do have to budget for some level of training, whatever it is. Um, and it's really important. And, and I've, you know, I've, I've, I've spoken to some companies that that budget a tremendous amount for training, and others that don't even think about it. And it's an afterthought. But I think whatever the training is that's most effective for the culture at your company, and it's different depending on the different cultures, uh, you got to budget something for each implementation. And and one of the interesting things that we saw in a study we ra we ran recently is that a lot of um, companies actually relying on their software vendor to train their suppliers. So if it's a portal or if an e-invoicing solution or if it's some type of um, you know, supplier portal uh, tool, the companies in the study that we did were actually relying on their software vendors to provide the suppliers with some level of support and training. And so I think it's a really important to look and see what your vendor can provide you because in some ways it, it might be a lot better than what you can do yourself. And Sarah, you want to add something to that? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Patrick's last comment uh, with regards to helping train vendor. I mean, you know, it's one thing to have um, the, the, the buyer be able to use the tool efficiently, but um, if when we send a, and exchange documents with the vendor, the, the vendor is constantly facing challenges, it's really going to slow things down for, for, for the buyer. So, um, uh, you know, recent learning on my part is, is, is definitely that. Uh, that uh, you need to also make sure that your suppliers are very proficient in, in using the tool, particularly those vendors that you deal with on a regular basis. Thank you. Just moving on. So the other part of it was, and you know, what we realized, and you know, Patrick did touch upon it earlier. It's not only about you know hiring the best talent, but it's about retaining the talent. And you know, one key part to that is identifying who your top talent is. Uh, somehow today, when we speak to companies about you know what are the metrics that you look for, or what are the different keys that you have to measure procurement performance, we hear about the metrics which are probably not the best reflection of a particular process performance. Right now, we hear things number of events conducted. That's probably a report that is downloaded from a sourcing tool very often. Now, I mean, you would have different categories, you would have different kinds of uh, procurement. Number of events conducted may not even be a valid measure. Uh, Patrick did touch upon earlier where, you know, there are things like supplier risk, uh, you know, the community expertise and certain other things which were probably not getting the right uh, support in the organization today or at least the focus. Um, so, See, you know, there could be different metrics like, you know, risk reduction, supply collaboration, you know, how proactive was your role in the entire new product design process and so on. 
but you know, unfortunately, we don't really see that being part of the KPI process today. So, what you know, the question that I had uh, was, you know, what do you think are the most important KPIs today to use to measure, uh, you know, the performance of a procurement professional? Maybe I could uh, stuff. Yeah, definitely. Well, our procurement team is is very um, very young as far as its uh, procurement journey is concerned. Uh, you know, we only. Uh, Started establishing procurement within the last uh, two years, so we're probably not as mature as a lot of uh, organisations are participating on the call. So we are only just at the point where we we have um, a few metrics that uh, what we've done is made sure that we are aligning with the overall metrics of the organisation. So for us, uh, looking at the sort of traditional uh, metric for procurement being. Um, uh, absolute savings and um, and value as being one, and then our other metrics are um, more focused on uh, supporting the company's overall mission. So, as we're a healthcare provider, you know how uh, patient centric are we, and how how are we working uh, cross functionally? So, since um, most of the projects we work on in in sourcing and procurement are actually cross functional, you know, as Patrick mentioned, it's critical that our um, employees have the skills to navigate through that type of project and feel comfortable at uh, um, at working um, with their peers in other uh, departments and can lead those projects. So that for us is, is an important one as well. But uh, you know, at, probably within the next year, we'll, we'll look to expand on, on those metrics. And um, I really see some of those as, as coming from um, uh, measuring as far as, far as uh, contracts are concerned, uh, and then perhaps broadening on the uh, the savings metrics as well. Right, and uh, so Patrick, I mean, do you actually see uh, you know the metrics followed in a lot of organizations, not, not actually the ones that you should be followed? Uh, what's your take on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think by government and CPOs. Specifically, to you know, to never never go to a meeting with your stakeholders with the metrics that procurement feels like they're successful on in hand, right? It's 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 about your 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 stakeholders and the business and understanding what their needs are and, and aligning your metrics to those. And so savings may be the most important. In other cases, maybe it's the number of new creative ideas that are brought to the table or even brought to market. Um, so it's really, in, in, and Sarah alluded to this. It's it, it really it ultimately depends on the strategy of the company and and, and procurement's role. But you know, savings isn't going to go away, and, and procurement is expected to drive a certain amount of savings. What I would say though is that increasingly we see companies trying to understand better for every dollar of savings that we have, how does that relate to each dollar of revenue? And, and so, for example, you could be driving. And 20% savings, uh, but if your cost of, of doing business is higher than your competition, then maybe you're paying too much for raw materials. Maybe you're paying too much for services. And so the idea of understanding savings in the context of revenue, in the context of what it actually takes to bring a product or service to market, uh, is, is a much better way of looking at things. But it takes a while to get there. Um, you know, the other, we do see some other interesting things happening out there. We see a lot of companies doing. You know, supply risk indexes, for example, and tracking and understanding how they can move that index needle to reduce um, the exposure of the company through different activities, whether it's you know risk audits or remediations. Um, ultimately, what we're seeing is that companies are in, or improvement is increasingly focused on the customer experience, the customer being the business and the key stakeholders, measuring customer satisfaction, whether it's through maybe a net promoter score um, or a combination of things. Maybe it's different one-on-one -on -one interviews and a survey after each sourcing event and a combination of different stakeholder inputs that essentially measure the experience of working with procurement so you know where you can improve. And frankly, the customer experience or what procurement is doing, their role isn't always going to be to make the customer happy. Procurement's role is to make sure that they're doing the right thing for the company while still being that trusted advisor to their stakeholders. So crafting a customer stakeholder survey 
that captures both elements of that is really important. Because otherwise, it just drives the wrong type of behavior. But I think the key takeaway there is that, that you know, this idea of infusing customer satisfaction and surveys and scores within procurement uh, is really important to, you know, to move beyond giving. Right. And Patrick, you know, uh, while I'm from Zykus, is not another, you know, particularly correct question to ask. Do you think, uh, you know, the different procurement applications that we have today, uh, they are uh, able to deliver these uh, uh, measurements to, to the end users? I mean, can people leverage these applications to get what they're looking for? Um, you know, I have um, a number of inquiries. For folks looking for procurement things type of dashboards, um, I understand that the Zykus, as well as a couple of other vendors out there, have relatively new offerings that, that you know that do that. Um, so, but I think you know the sense that I get, quite candidly, is that it's you know there's still a lot of room to go when it comes to software vendors being able to um, provide all the capabilities that are really needed to effectively measure how well procurement is doing. Um, get a lot of inquiries where companies are just, you know, there's a lot more room to, to grow there. Right. Thanks, Patrick. Sure. So, Patrick, uh, why don't you take us uh, to closing thoughts? Okay. A couple of canned ones here, and then I think we have a couple of questions in the Q&A, too. Um, so what is, what, what, what's really working? What, what are some of the key things that we want to make sure that you take away from this? You know, the number one thing is this idea of staff rotations across businesses and geographies. Um, you know, this is a great way to identify top performers, but also build cultural awareness. You know, you have folks that, you know, for example, are going to Singapore, and you have folks from Singapore going back to whether London or Toronto or Miami, wherever it is, and, and sharing best practices and sharing a, a different level of cultural understanding and bringing those back with them are really, really, really important in this global model that we work in. And rotations are really key to that. We also talk about partnerships between HR and procurement to really pinpoint training needs and develop solutions. Um, in some cases, companies rely on HR to try to you know, develop a training curriculum and, and roll it out. But I think we've seen some great studies uh, in the last couple of years where procurement is leading the charge. Procurement has you know, created a curriculum They've created, um, you know, a, a different, you know, program that essentially certifies different levels within their organization, and, and they really led the charge and didn't rely on HR to, you know, to, to support them. And so, you know, in some cases, that is the right approach. Um, we talked about business acumen and, and being important, but strong facilitation and communication skills, um, you know, and looking at those during the hiring process and development programs. It's a different type of interview process when you're looking for communication and, and business acumen and facilitation. And sometimes it means a case study. Sometimes it means a presentation, whatever it is. But it's, you know, it's a different way of interviewing beyond the basics of just, you know, what is your knowledge in a specific category or how experienced are you in procurement and, and purchasing. Um, you know, transformation requires people who bring creativity and thinking to the table and to raise controversial issues and consider alternative ideas. Um, you know, right back, there's a CPO of a very, very large company that, you know, that we spoke with, and, and he referred to this idea of group think within procurement and trying to surround himself not with a bunch of people that all think the same, that all do the same things, that all have experience in the same areas, but surround himself instead with engineers, people from R&D, people from different departments, different groups, and putting them together to create natural friction that helps solve problems in a different way. And so this is really one of the key things that he felt was successful and something that we like to share with others. Um, again, we talked a lot about training and just pulling from different sources and putting the right program together. And then some type of ongoing measuring in place, shuffling people around, shuffling skills around, just finding the right mix. This isn't where these kind of set it and forget it and build the team and, and execute. And, you know, there's a lot of shifting and changing of roles and skills as time goes on. Some of the key things that you know, we found in the study and, and we wanted to show other folks, but you know, Sarah, you're out there and you've got a team working on these things. Is there anything you'd like to add to that or closing thoughts where you you know, really have seen talent development working within your organization? Yeah, I really, um, uh, not specifically in uh, the company I work in, but I 
I really uh, support your viewpoint as far as Russians, uh, particularly internationally. I think I'm a case in point, you know. Um, thankfully, I got the opportunity to work for a company that, that saw you in that. So having the chance to work in a different country or in a different different uh, business unit or a di in a different role within procurement, I think all of those things are excellent, and they really help to give an individual a, a much, much broader viewpoint. So they can be, a, you know, a thought leader or more of a sort of consent to a, a cross-functional business partner. So <clears throat> I think, you know, where, where companies have the opportunity to do those things, I, I think uh, I think it's great. Um, that's something that we've been trying to um, start within, you know, my team. But again, like I mentioned, we're sort of very uh, early on in our development here. But um, so I'll definitely be taking those into consideration. What about the um, what about Kinnish? What do you, do you have anything from the Zykus perspective? I mean, I, I imagine even at Zykus, you know, there's certain training and things that work, and uh, a global company. Again, uh, Patrick, uh, what we have seen, and again, not only from a Zykus perspective, but when we're talking to or interact with our customers, uh, what we see is what really works is sharing of best practices, and you know that actually brings us to a, a talk on our in our annual meet, I'll come to that probably later. But you know, one thing that really works is where you know, you know, the procurement uh, teams across companies, across geographies can get together, share ideas, share thoughts. That really works best. I mean, for Zykus, for example, what we realized is, you know, there are a lot of ways that you can leverage value out of the application that you use. And times, you know, how somebody or a peer or some other person in you know, industry is doing it really helps. And that that helping those customers connect is something that we believe uh, adds a tremendous amount of value. Um, so, uh, can I not sure where you want to go from here? We do have a couple questions in Q and A. Uh, one of them looks like it's definitely directed to you, because uh, it's more of a security issue around mobile. Um, let me hold one question, and then I'll pass it back to you. Um, there's a question around metrics and you know, tangible metrics that you can tie to a number. Um, one of the things that I would suggest, um, we actually, Hackett and Zykit, we did a joint presentation um, about a year ago where we, and it was a SIG presentation, where we went through the top 10 or 15 metrics that every procurement organization tracks. Um, what I'd suggest is follow up with your Zykus team after this and ask if you can get a copy of that presentation too, because that really went into very kind of crunchy metrics metrics um, that we think every organization should track. So rather than go through them here, that's probably a better approach. Um, I want to field um, one of the, couple of the other questions. There's one around security and mobility. Sure. Just uh, there was, I think, a follow-up question on that, Patrick, um, on the metrics uh, about total cost of ownership. And, you know, we definitely feel as like us that ultimately it should be total cost of ownership and not just uh, savings. Uh, or because you know if your suppliers across the globe, uh, you need to also factor in your shipping cost, cost of uh, servicing and maintenance, and so on. Uh, but sometimes what happens is a challenge to actually accurately measure that. So it's obviously uh, you need to figure out how you can accurately come to that. But yes, that is something that you know we and you know our companies strive to uh, calculate, and we strive to enable that. Uh, and just coming back to the other question that was there on the mobile devices, it. Um, not the right forum to go into the technical details of it, and we'll be happy if you can reach us to us separately. We'll be more than happy to share with us, you know, our uh, security, uh, what we have done around that. Uh, having said that, probably I'll just uh, take uh, just a couple of minutes to talk about, you know, uh, our strategy around, you know, the mobile solutions. So we broadly look at mobile solutions in two distinct parts. Uh, one, what I would say is where you would do some procurement activities uh, that would probably not be on your smartphone. When I say mobile, it probably would be more of an iPad or your tablet. Uh, that is where we ensure that our applications are tablet optimized. So you actually use the application, leverage all the touch features of your iPad, and work the way you want to. You, you work today on a web application, right? The other thing is on the smartphone. On the smartphone, we would like you to probably do minimal activities. I don't think you would like, you know, end up creating a very large purchase order with like 100 lines on a mobile phone. But you know, things like looking at alerts, uh, 
approving uh, orders, approving requisitions, uh, looking at certain alerts, looking at certain shipment delays and, and things like that, right? So that's that's kind of the approach that we have taken. And again, uh, this may not be the right forum, so you know, please reach out to us and we can have a little discussion around this. Okay, <clears throat> I think there was a couple questions, but um, you know, why don't we talk a little bit about an action plan? Um, you know, just something that, and again, this is included in the report, so that um, is available. But you know, a couple of things. Um, you know, first, as as procurement and sourcing executives, you know, we really just need to own up to the current skills gap and take control of this. And you know, many organizations know they have a skills deficit, but they're too consumed by the day-to-day -day operations to really think about the impact of a talent shortage on their performance, right? And, and so we really feel like it's position for success, relevancy, you know, they need to face this issue head on. And, you know, maybe it's doing some type of talent management self-assessment or capability maturity assessment. And there's plenty of them available out there on the market. Hack has one. Different folks have one. But ultimately, it's taking some baseline, understand where you're at in terms of skills and where you need to go. Um, you know, articulating a vision. So articulating a vision tied to the overall company strategy. What does procurement expect from its talent, and how will these expectations change as the strategy changes? And get input from the business as well as HR to create a vision of, of what this profile is, and then get a talent roadmap for how you're going to get there. Maybe it includes hiring from management consulting companies. Maybe it includes hiring you know, from other um, companies in similar industries. Maybe it includes taking and moving folks out of the business and into procurement for even temporary rotations. Whatever the strategy is, you have to have a strategy to execute against it. Defiles and responsibilities. So, you know, as they relate to HR and talent management, I think one of the key things here, and I think a lot of executives realize this, is the typical aspect, it's not HR's responsibility. Procurement has to own its talent plan, and HR is really a partner in some cases where maybe they support it. But, you know, support varies widely when it comes to HR. And so, if they have a track record of delivering, then great, leverage them. But I mentioned before that we see a lot of procurement organizations driving curriculums and change themselves, coming up with their own programs. Develop a procurement talent plan. So, you know, we talked about this, the idea of once the gap is understood and articulated, um, relationship with HR has been defined, then, you know, go and identify the skills required to support the future data operating model. And, and that's really key is to understand the skills in the context of the operating model, whether it's centralized, decentralized, outsourced, because that's really going to change. And maybe if you have a plan to change your operating model, make sure you're putting the skills in place, the right skills in place to support your future vision. Institutionalize the talent management capability. You know, so this is really just about continually monitoring and assessing skills and actually building talent into the strategic and operational planning cycle. And then ultimately, it's about executing on the plan, you know, so having an extensive program management expertise around talent, progress reports, cost satisfaction surveys, on that, putting it in your newsletters, measuring these, these things, but you know, really showcasing procurement success, getting back out there to the stakeholders, articulating where you're doing well, and if you're not doing well in an area, what you're doing to change and build up your center of excellence, your competency. So those are some of the key actions that we like to share with folks. Um, is there anything to add to that? Or, and, and, and maybe you can pass to Sarah when you're done. Um, on this, I mean, actually, uh, before we kind of open up for questions, I don't know if we'll have time. We just wanted to quickly take, uh, you know, uh, the folks through what we offer at Zykus here. So uh, if you see, Dave, uh, you know, at Zykus, this, we have this complete comprehensive suite solution today and I think there was a, even a question earlier probably I'll probably kind of take that right now about you know analysis and supplier uh, management and so on so uh, to what we realize is unless you have a holistic solution which kind of encompasses all requirements you have in the procurement world you would not be able to get value out of it so that's where you know Zykus has uh, solutions like iSave, where you can actually create you know the different uh, savings uh, metrics and track them from the tactical procurement uh, that you do. Uh, we have you know uh, spend analysis and parented solutions around auto class, which actually helps you analyze the data and then let you drive business insights out of it. So so what I want to leave you with is this kind of holistic solution that we offer at Zykus. 
And just that we really wanted to take you through what we have uh, coming up. So we have Horizon 2015 coming up uh, October 4th to 6th. Uh, this is our annual event. You know, last year we had like 100 plus companies, 200 uh, plus and so on. And you know, as Patrick was mentioning and, and as also we feel, the tremendous amount of value in connecting, right? Um, if you want to understand the best practices, this is the best place for you, uh, you know, to socialize and interact. I mean, there's nothing like learning from your peers. Um, the other thing is obviously there are not going to be knowledge sessions. Uh, as you can see, 25 plus knowledge sessions, 30 plus speakers, and so on. So we would really like you to join us here. Uh, and there's also a promo code for you there. If you see Webcast 100, you use that and you get the dollar 100 discount. So we would really like all of you guys, uh, you know, to join us here at Horizon this year. Um, having said that, I think we are uh, out of time. So you know, if you have further questions, if you could just mail it to us. Um, you have uh, my ID here. You have Patrick's mail ID here, or uh, you could send it to the webcast ID that uh, you had from Zykus. I think it's webcast at Zykus dot com. We'll be more than happy to you know uh, answer those questions. Um, Patrick, Sarah, any uh, closing lines from you? No, thank you. I'm fine. No, I think we've we've covered everything. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me today, and uh, I enjoyed the session. Thank you everybody for joining the session. I hope you you know found it informative.